Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before we go any further, I'd like everyone who can hear me to go ahead and put up a green check mark. If you're new to Blackboard Collaborate, the green check mark can be found right below your name in the participants panel, which is below the talk button. By clicking on the fourth button from the left and selecting the green check mark, uh, and in case you're having trouble finding it, here's a screenshot of where you can find the green check mark. And once you select it, you'll see a check mark appear next to your name in the participants list. So I see Angela has it up, and Celeste. I just put it up because yeah. I wanted. JJ and Bill, can you hear me okay? Okay, it looks like there are a few of us who either can't hear me or having trouble finding the check mark. Um, and although we don't have time to provide technical support during this session, I'm going to go ahead and put up this next slide. And hopefully this will be helpful to those of you who might still be having trouble with your audio. It's just a few quick points. I know it sounds obvious, but I've seen it happen so many times. So make sure that you have your volume turned up on your speakers or your headphones. Um, also, if that doesn't work for you and the audio setup wizard isn't helping, you can always dial into the session by phone with a number and PIN that are listed here. And if all else fails, please know that the session is being recorded and will be made available at a later date. Likewise, if you would like a copy of the slides used in this session, you can always email the IDT team and we'd be happy to send them out to you. So you guys can go ahead and put, put down your green check marks. And last, um, and now that we hopefully have the audio squared away, I just wanted to share a few standard Blackboard Collaborate best practices that I'd like you all to be aware of and also recommend that you follow for today's session. So first, with all the audio and video streaming that happens during a live session, in order for Blackboard to run smoothly on your computer, it's highly recommended that you close any other programs that you might have open or are running. While it's possible to run other programs with Blackboard, this can sometimes cause Blackboard to freeze up or drop the audio or even shut down. So closing all their programs is one way to help to prevent this from happening. Next, for your audio, it's recommended that you use a headset instead of your computer's microphone and speakers. In Blackboard, audio in a headset typically comes through much clearer than on speakers. And sometimes when you use your computer's microphone and speakers with Blackboard instead of a headset, this can cause feedback, which is a high-pitched squealing noise that you may have heard before in a session. Next, just be aware of your talk button. Only press this button down when you're ready to turn it on your mic, and remember to press it again when you're finished talking. I've been in sessions before where people forget to turn off their mic, and then a few minutes later you can hear them watching TV, eating a snack, or yelling at someone in the background, which can be distracting to others in the class and somewhat embarrassing for the person whose mic is still on. And next, if at any point during the session you have a comment or question, please remember to raise your hand using the hand button. Or if you'd rather not use your microphone, you can always type questions or comments into the chat panel. And last, remember to click on the away icon if you step away from your computer. This way I know um, not to call on you or ask you a question. So these five points are good basic guidelines to remember and share with your students whenever you're teaching in Blackboard. And again, you don't have to write any of this down, as I'll be happy to send out these slides to anyone who asks. So now that we have all the logistics out of the way, I'd like to welcome everyone again to our first faculty focus seminar for the 2014-2015 school year. Um, today's session is designed to, Celeste, do you have your hand up? Oh, maybe not. Okay, today's so, uh, session. No, I was just trying to find the away icon you mentioned. Okay. okay. Today's session is designed to familiarize everyone with the Blackboard Collaborate live online meeting tool and also to provide you with some tips and best practice strategies for conducting a successful online synchronous class session. If you're new to Blackboard Collaborate or maybe you've used it before but you need a refresher or maybe you'd like to go a little bit beyond the basics, then this is the session for you. If you're an experienced Collaborate user and know how to locate and use all the tools, then this session might not be the best use of your time and I will not be offended if at any point during the session you decide to leave. So since Blackboard is a new tool, offering a one-size-fits-all training session for all of our users, 
just wasn't possible, but hopefully the topics that we plan on covering today will meet the needs of the majority of those of you in attendance. And we have a big agenda today, and we're really going to try to get through everything. But if for some reason we don't make it, then we'll definitely schedule a second session at some point down the road. So with that being said, my name again is Kevin Lucy, and I'm an instructional designer at SCPS. And I will be one of the co-presenters today. Our other presenter is Celeste Green, and I'm going to step aside for a second and ask her to go ahead and introduce herself. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, Celeste Green, I know several of you, and I'm, I'm so glad to see you all here today. And this session is really to provide an overview and go a little bit deeper into Blackboard Collaborate and conducting live sessions, because this is something that we're really stressing the importance of. Of students want to have more live sessions, and there's so many new things out there that we want to make sure that our faculty have the tools they need to to conduct a successful live session. So Kevin has pre prepared all the slides, and feel free anytime if you have questions, um, you will get an email with the slides, and um, and if you have any questions throughout. But it's really just to be informative, and we want to have this. This is part of a new series we're starting every month, and we'll have other topics. Um, such as how to do an I rubric, um, which is possibly going to be our next topic. If there are topics that you would like to address in these sessions, please let us know. These are all recorded, so if you can't come to one, they'll be available for you. But we really want to hear from the faculty as far as what are topics that you would like to hear, and we might even address this in a two-part because there's so much to do today with this, this session. So thank you all for coming, and I'll let Kevin take over. Thank you, Celeste, and please feel free to jump in at any any time during the session today. So now that Celeste and I have introduced ourselves, another Blackboard best practice is to always start your class sessions with some type of icebreaker or introduction where the students can say hello. And this also serves the dual purpose of making sure that everyone's audio is working correctly. Or it could even be used as a way to assess your students' prior knowledge or experience just as we're do, going to do here. So we're going to just go right down the list. And if everyone can briefly just say their name, what course we'll be teaching this fall, and whether or not you've used Blackboard Collaborate before to teach a class, that would be great. If you're new to Collaborate, all that you need to do is click on the Talk button to get started. And if anyone's feeling brave enough, they can also click on the Video button as well. But if you do use video, remember that you'll need to click both Talk and Video. So let's get started with um, who's first. JJ, can you go ahead and say hello? Make sure, um, JJ, to click on the talk button up on the upper left-hand side there under where you saw Kevin's name. Now you see my name. There's a talk button right there. I, I see it. I see JJ typing there. He said that um can't use audio. So that's good. That's fine. Um, JJ, if you could just type in there, have you used Blackboard Collaborate to teach before? Great. This will be a perfect session um, for you. All right. So let's go on to Angela. Could you go ahead and say hello? Uh, sure. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yep. I can hear you great. Good. Um, I'm Angela. I'm brand new uh, adjunct at UVA, so I have not used Blackboard Collaborate uh, to teach before. I'll be teaching Securing the Internet of Things uh, starting in a couple of weeks, so I'm pretty excited. I've used similar tools to this, though, um, but I'm excited to learn about this specific tool. Great. Thank you. How about Bill? Hi, Kevin. Uh, Bill Cardine. I'll be teaching cost accounting this fall, and yes, I've used uh, Blackboard before. Thanks, Bill. Um, how about Paige? I'm Paige Duffy. I'll be teaching uh, PSMT uh, 6010 eMarketing Tools and Techniques, and I have used Blackboard. Thanks, Paige. I think I may have skipped over Cindy. Cindy, could you say hi? Actually, it looks like Cindy's mic is off. Um, if you just want to text something in the chat box, that'd be fine, Cindy. And then uh, I think Pam is next. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Gibson, and I've been using Blackboard for some time. Thank you, Pam. And then 
Pit Paul is last. Go ahead, Pit Paul. Okay, Pit Paul, I'm not sure if um, your audio is working for you, but um, if you want, you can go ahead and type in a text chat or you can also dial in by phone. Uh, this is Pit Paul Kocher. I have used uh, that Blackboard Collaborate before uh, with IT3 3400 database design course. Do I do have an issue with application sharing under Windows 8 or 8.1? It is very, very slow. The screen kind of just, you know, scrolls with lines showing line by line by line by line. Don't have an issue under Windows 7, but do have an issue on, issue under Windows 8. I think it has got something to do with JavaScript not running under the browser, but running as a separate 32-bit uh, application under Windows 8. Okay, yeah, I think um, we, we're going to get to application sharing later, but um, something that that is that specific with um, Windows 7 versus 8 and JavaScript, that might be something that we might have to send you to Blackboard support for, but we'll try to get to that a little later in the session. I think that's everybody. Um, looks like we have a diverse group today, and hopefully we'll be able to tailor our session to cover topics and questions that are relevant to everybody. And with that being said, let's let's take a look at the outline for our session. So today the goal of our session is to provide you with an overview of the Collaborate interface, show you the main tools and features, what they do, how to use them, and then leave you with what we think are several helpful best practices that we've gathered from our combined experience teaching and working with this tool. One last thing as we move forward with this session, please understand that we have a lot of material to cover in a short amount of time. So if we're going too fast or if you have a question or need us to clarify something, just please raise your hand and let us know and we'll get to you. And we'll also try to leave some time at the end for questions as well. Okay, so let's get started with an overview of the Blackboard Collaborate interface. Really, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, as you can see, there are two main areas. The panels are located on the left side of the interface, taking up maybe a fifth of the real estate. And then the content area, which sometimes is referred to as the whiteboard, even though they're not quite the same thing, takes up everything to the right of the panels, making up the rest of the interface. So we'll start out by looking at the panels. And as you can see, there are three distinct areas, the audio video panel, the participants panel, and the chat panel. And even though the whiteboard takes up more room and is where you display your content, as I'm doing now with my slides, the importance of the panels is that they more or less act as a control center for the session. And the panels area is also where most of the interaction between you and your students is going to take place, or at least well, where it will originate from. Then the other main area of the Collaborate interface is the content area. Although it looks to be just a blank slate, there are a number of things that you can do here, such as upload and show your slides for a lecture or presentation. You can share your desktop or another application on your computer with your students. And you can also pull up and view pages from the web here. There's even a number of drawing and text tools that you can see there on the left side of the content area that you can use with your students to highlight or make annotations on something, on the, um, you know, on a slide that you'd bring up such as a picture or a chart or a formula or an equation or something like that. And you can even clear out the slides altogether and pull up a blank screen like we see here and then use the tools to illustrate a concept or to work out a problem or even for a brainstorming session. And we'll talk about how to do these things a little later on. And I think, Pritt Paul, you might have your microphone still turned on. Looks like that to me. Okay, so let's get into the tools and features and collaborate and how to use them. In this section, we're going to cover panels, polling, assigning permissions, the content area, and how to create and use breakout rooms. So we're going to start off with the audio video pan panel. And as you can see, there's not a lot to it, but we're going to quickly review a few of the features. And I'm going to use the laser pointer tool which we'll go over a little later to highlight the areas that I'll be talking about. So please raise your hand if after a few seconds you don't see a red dot circling around on the screen. So you should see that now. And if you don't, just go ahead and raise your hand. 
So as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, if for some reason a student was having problems with their audio, they can always dial into the session by phone. And they do this by clicking on the little telephone icon there in the panel, and then a set of instructions will pop up on how to dial in. All sessions are automatically assigned a phone number and a PIN number, and students can also find this information on your Collab site when they click on your session. So to the right of the teleconference, we have the audio setup wizard, which we should all be familiar with by now. And regardless of how many times you or your students have used Blackboard Collaborate, it's a best practice to always use it to check your audio before you start a session. And to the right of the setup wizard, we see a little stack of dashed lines which is the options menu. And you'll see an options menu that looks just like this in several different areas of Collab, but each one is unique to the area in which it's located. For instance, if you were to click on the options menu here, you'd be given options for adjusting settings for your microphone, your speakers, your webcam, things like that. A lot of these things you can also do from the menu bar at the top of your screen, but the options menu just gives you another way to access these things. Okay, so below my picture, you'll see two sliders. The one on the left adjusts the volume for your microphone. So if your students are saying that they're having trouble hearing you, even when their volume's turned all the way up, this is where you might want to make an adjustment. And then the slider on the right, this is, where, um, this is where you'll adjust the volume of your speakers. And along with this slider being properly adjusted, um, you just want to make sure that the volume on your computer is adjusted to an appropriate level as well. And then at the bottom, we have a talk button, which we talked about earlier when I reminded everyone about turning off the talk button when you're done speaking. But if we're going to follow that advice, it's also important to remember to turn the mic back on when you want to talk. I've been in sessions when out of nowhere there is a long extended pause and no one knows what's going on. It's because the teacher was going on and on trying to make a point, but they had turned the talk button off and then they forgot to click it back on so nobody got to hear what they were saying. So it's good advice to keep tabs on your talk button and always be aware of whether it's on or off. And then finally, next to the talk button is the video button, which you click on to turn on your webcam. And then on the right edge of the video button, you see a little magnifying glass over the top of the silhouette of a person. And if you press that, you'll get a little preview of what your webcam is seeing. This is a nice feature so you can be sure of what your webcam is seeing before you click video and send it off for the whole class to see. And so that's the audio panel. Do we have any questions so far? All right, let's move on to the participants panel. So the participants panel, as you can see, is also fairly basic when viewed on its own, but there's some helpful features tucked away here. Pam, do you have a question? I do, Kevin. Um, I have a, a profile photograph, but it's not appearing, and I wonder why that is. Did you load it um, through your preferences in Blackboard Collaborate? Yes, I did. Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> I know sometimes mine doesn't appear at first, and if I click the video button to turn my camera on, and then I turn it off, then suddenly my photo appears. And I don't know why that is. Blackboard is kind of, or Collaborate's kind of a buggy tool to begin with, so it's really you know, hard to explain sometimes why some things work and some things don't, but maybe you might want to try that. Okay, let me see if I can shoot. No, but I'll I'll keep playing with it. Thanks. Okay, sorry that didn't work for you. Um and. Okay, so we're back on the participants panel. Um, as I was saying, it's also, you know, a fairly basic area of collab when, when it's viewed on its own, but there's some helpful features here, especially if you have moderator privileges enabled, which for most of the session is just going to be me, but later when you create your own sessions, you'll be able to go in and play around with some of these features on your own. So the main area of the participants panel is the participants list, which shows everyone who's currently logged into the session. This area is located right underneath the words main room, and you can scroll through it and see everyone who's present today, and also whether or not they have an activity or status associated with their name. So when I say activity or status, what I'm referring to is how you can see a little blue microphone 
um, icon that's lit up right next to my name in the participants list. If I were to turn on my video, raise my hand, or use the whiteboard, you'd also see indicators for these symbols as well. These indicators are helpful for a bunch of different reasons. One example might be if you were teaching a large class and it's early on in the semester and most people don't recognize each other's voices yet, the microphone indicator will tell you exactly who's speaking. This is especially helpful for the students since they pretty quickly get used to the instructor's voice, but it might take a while for them to get to know the voices of their classmates. Another way in which these indicators can be useful is if a student is trying to talk but no sound is coming out, you would start the troubleshooting process by checking to see if their microphone indicator was turned on. So in general, these indicators are good, if nothing more than to give the instructor and the students an idea of who's doing what in the class. So let's move on to the four status buttons that are located toward the top of the panel and underneath your name. I'm going to highlight those now. These can be used to provide feedback to the instructor or to whoever is presenting or leading the class. So when you click on the smiley face icon and select an icon from the drop-down menu, whichever item you select will appear underneath your name in the participants list. So I'll give you all a second to click on that button and explore the options. You can go ahead and select a few if you'd like. Let's go ahead and just play around with that button for a second. All right, I see some people are applauding. Thank you. So you or your students may or may not use the feedback button very often, but if you do, it just gives everyone in the room another way to interact with each other. And so the next button, next to that icon button, is the away button, which you would use to let the instructor know that you'd stepped away from the session for a minute, and that way they know not to call on you or ask you a question. Then next to that is the raise hand button, which is fairly self-explanatory. And the one nice thing about this button is that if you ask a question to your class and six people raise their hand, it keeps track of the order in which the hands were raised, which you may or may not find useful, but I kind of like that. And then the last status button is the polling button. You can use this button with your students by asking them to click on it and respond to prompts or questions throughout your class session. And we're going to get a little more into polling on the next slide. And the last area that I wanted to point out in the participants panel are the permissions. I'm just circling those right now. And you can see the area right to the right of the words main room. Here, um, you'll be able to click on any one of these little icons and grant or deny everyone on the participants list access to different tools and collaborate, such as the microphone, the whiteboard, and so on. And we'll get into some more detailed permissions in a few minutes. But first, let's get back to polling. So in Collaborate, you can set up two different kinds of polls, ones that require a yes-no response or ones that are multiple choice. To select between the two options, you can either open the Tools menu in the menu bar that's across the top of your screen and then choose Polling, or you can click on the Options menu in the Participants panel, scroll down to Polling Type, and then select the type of poll that you'd like to use. And keep in mind that for this session, since you all don't have moderator privileges, you won't be able to see or access these menus. But depending on which type of poll you select, this changes the options for the students when they click on the polling button. So for instance, now you can only choose between yes, no, the green, red check mark. But when I change the options, which I'm going to do now, now if you click on the polling button, you can go ahead and try it. You'll see that you can select from choices A through D. So moving on, polls can really be used a number of different ways during a class session and collaborate. And you can see some suggestions here on the slide. So as an example, an informal type of poll question would be one like we did at the beginning of the session when I asked everyone to put up a green check mark if they could hear me. Further into a session, polls can be a great way to really quickly check for student understanding. For example, after introducing a new concept on a slide, you could ask your students to put up a green check mark if they understand or a red check mark if they aren't ready to move on just yet. This way, you stand a better chance of not losing your students and when you're, when you're covering something complex. Also, another nice feature of the polling tool is that instead of having to count all the individual student responses, which can be cumbersome with a large class, the instructor can publish student responses in real time directly to the whiteboard from either of the two menus that I mentioned earlier and are also listed on this page. I'll show you an example of publishing results to the whiteboard in just a minute.
So in addition to verbally asking questions to your students, you can also add poll questions to the slides in your presentation. So for example, here's an example of a poll that could be used as an icebreaker at the beginning of class. So how about everyone take a second to respond and I'll publish the results on the whiteboard. Well, I think we have an optimistic group today, but I don't know how accurate it's going to be, but we can always hope. The season is young, so maybe UVA will win. All right, and here's one more example of a different type of poll. And I'm going to switch your polling type here. Okay, so this is an example of the type of question that you could use as a formative assessment to see if your lesson was addressing your students' needs, or even as a way to assess their prior knowledge on a specific topic. So with that in mind, why don't we go ahead and respond to this poll, and I'll publish the results for this one as well. Well, Good to get feedback, but this one isn't very helpful. I think we have two for creating breakout rooms, two for sharing the desktop, two for uploading PowerPoints. So we're kind of all spread out here, but we're going to get to all of those things, so that's okay. Okay. So what you see here is a screenshot of what I see next to my name in the participants panel as the moderator for the session. And all of these little icons to the right of my name represent different tools and features in Collaborate. And by clicking on them as the moderator, I have the power to grant or deny access to them for anyone in the session. Also, you might notice that I have two rows of these icons. If I clicked on one of the icons in the top row, it would affect everyone in the room, except for me. But then if I wanted to adjust the permissions for just one person in the room, then I can do that by scrolling down through the participants list and then granting or denying them access to something individually. Also, the instructor can scroll to anyone in the participants list and remove them from the room or grant them full moderator privileges. The reason why you'd want to grant your students moderator privileges is that this is the only way that the students can have access to upload a PowerPoint to the whiteboard. So for instance, if you're teaching an online class and you wanted to assign a group project where the students presented their work, then you would have the class meet and collaborate assign moderator, moderator privileges to that group, or just those who will be presenting, and then they can upload the PowerPoint and do their presentation. Some faculty who have their students do a lot of presentations just automatically grant everyone in the room moderator privileges. And really, at this level, we're all teaching adults, and granting moderator privileges to the whole class seems to work out fine. And plus, it's easier than having to grant and take away privileges all the time. And really quickly, going over the permission icons from left to right, we have a microphone, we have a webcam, we have text chat, the whiteboard, application sharing, which has a red X through it, and access to the web, which also has an X through it. Um, and we'll get to those all in a few minutes. And as you can see, um, by default, you all have access to the mic, the camera, the text chat, and the whiteboard. But you can't share your desktop or pull up a web page in our session. So before we go on, can anyone think of a reason why, as an instructor, you might want to turn any one of the default permissions on or off for your students? I just gave the example of allowing students to do presentations, but can anyone think of another reason why you might want to change the permissions? You can go ahead and raise your hand if you think you might have an idea. Pam, go ahead. I'm thinking if you have someone who inadvertently does have their mic on and you've you've called on people to please turn it off and and they don't they're not aware it's them. Yes, that is a very common one. Gladys, did you have another one? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you great. Oh great. Um, maybe someone is monopolizing the conversation and um, you need to give other people a chance to talk. Yes, that's one that happens a lot too. Um, another one is sometimes instructors just like to turn off the chat option because sometimes students can really 
you know, just start chatting away with each other in the private chat and, you know, kind of stop paying attention. So sometimes an instructor might want to do that. But I'm sure none of that's going on today. Okay. So the last panel is the chat panel. And this is the area where anyone in the session can use text chat to communicate with others in the room. And so there's several ways to do that. And the most obvious is to just type a message into the white box at the bottom of the panel, hit return, and then it appears in the window for the whole room to see. In my experience, the chat panel is one of the more heavily used features in Collaborate since it's a quick and easy way to chime in on a conversation, answer a question, or state an opinion without having to get on the mic. A lot of times, students who are reluctant to use the microphone, they feel more comfortable using the chat panel and will make more frequent contributions than they would have otherwise if they only had to use the mic. So as you can see on my slide, my chat panel looks slightly different than yours in that in addition to the main room, I also have a tab at the bottom for moderators. This tab shows up by default if you're the moderator, and if you click on it, it lets you communicate privately with any other moderators in the room. This can be helpful if you're co-presenting with someone or if you need to send a message to a student who's presenting, such as slow down or time to wrap it up. And likewise, you all have the permission to send a private chat to anyone in the room just by hovering your cursor over their name, clicking on the options menu that appears, and selecting send a private chat. And then once you do that, a new tab will show up at the bottom of your panel with that person's name. And this is where you can have a private conversation that no one else in the room will see. Now, there are a few caveats that come with using private chats and collaborate. First and foremost, please be careful what you type. Um, I can't tell you how many sessions I've been in where someone thought they were typing a message in the private chat tab, and then by accident, they typed it in the wrong box, and something either embarrassing or inappropriate shows up in the main room for everyone to see. So that's never good. And my best advice would be, even in a private chat, Keep it strictly professional because you never know when you're going to accidentally type in the wrong tab. And then just like Twitter, once it's out there, it's out there. And the last thing I want to mention about chats is when you're creating your Blackboard Collaborate session, you can choose the option of having supervised chats. And what that means is that as the instructor, you'll be able to see all of the private chats that are going on in your room. Now, depending on how brave you are, you may or may not want to do this. I tend to lean on the side of not supervising chats. I look at it as we're teaching adults, and I feel like by supervising their chats, we're implying that we don't trust them. If they want to have a private chat, let them go ahead and do it. And most of the times, it's usually about class material anyway. But it might be something that they don't want to distract the rest of the cl class with. For instance, um, they might be using private chat to ask their peers about a homework question, something they didn't understand something they might, you know, just feel insecure about to ask in front of the whole class. So as I mentioned earlier, if you can, if you think it's a distraction, you can always turn the chats off. And I tend to think of it as another way for students to interact with each other, and they can engage with the topic and contribute to the class. But it's really up to each of you how you want to set up your class. All right, any questions about the chat panel? All right, moving on, one last thing with the panels. You can take any of the panels and collaborate and detach them, resize them, or rearrange their order. And I hardly ever take advantage of this feature, but I just wanted you to be aware of it in case you want to do it. Um, the only reason that I can think of that you might want to mess around with one of the panels is if you were teaching a class and a lot of text chatting was going on. Um, since the ch chat panel is pretty small, you can just attach it and put it somewhere else on your screen and then expand it to a bigger size so that you can see, you can see more student text at one time, which would be helpful. Um, you know, it's helpful to see the text in context and read more than one at a time. So I'll give everyone just maybe 10 seconds or so to go ahead and play around with the panels, and you can detach and resize and reattach if you want. Okay, we're going to move on to the content area. And the content area is the main focal point of Blackboard Collaborate, and this is the area where you're seeing all of my slides. The content area can be put into three different modes by clicking on one of the icons located in the content area menu in the top left corner and to the right of the audio video panel. And I have these icons here on the slide so you can see them better. And from left to right, they're the whiteboard, application sharing, and web tour. And by default, when you launch a Collaborate session as the instructor, you'll be in whiteboard mode with a blank screen. 
So if you were the instructor and we were to continue across the menu at the top of the content area, you'd see the icons for information, load content, and record. You have the information icon available in your Collaborate menu, but for you to see the other two, you'd have to have moderator privileges. So although their names are self-explanatory, these last two icons are very important as you use load, I load content um, to upload the PowerPoint slides for your session, and then you'll use the record button to record your session. It's very important to remember to record all of your sessions, and usually Collaborate automatically reminds you to do this at the start of every session. So once you record a session, it's automatically saved to your Collab site. So any students who missed, missed your class can view it later, and even students who are in class, they sometimes like having the recordings because sometimes they go back and watch a lecture again or just a specific segment of the lecture for clarification. And at the bottom of the slide, I have a collapsed view of the Page Explorer, which we will talk about a little later. And as the instructor, you would use the Page Explorer to navigate through your slides. So let's talk about some of the content that you can load into Collaborate. Um, for all intents and purposes, the only file type that you're ever going to load into Collaborate is a PowerPoint file. You can upload just about any type of image file, but I'm not quite sure how that would be more useful than just using a PowerPoint or placing your image in a PowerPoint. Then you can also upload whiteboard files. I'm hesitant to even talk about whiteboard files because they can be a really big pain. To make a long story short, um, using the Collaborate Live Session Creator in your UVA Collab site, you can convert a PowerPoint to a whiteboard file and then preload this file into your live session so that it's there when you launch the session. And the process for doing this is actually kind of complex and sometimes it doesn't even work. And you can trust me, we've, we've actually received a lot of complaints about it. So the point is we're all much better off not worrying about whiteboard files and just joining our Collaborate sessions a few minutes early and uploading our PowerPoints directly into the live session. And the uploading process, it's as easy as can be. You just click on load content and a window will open where you can browse your computer. You find the file, you click, click OK, and it just takes a few seconds to upload. Any questions on this? Um, just real quick, Kevin, because everybody here doesn't have moderator privileges, they don't see that icon. And it's generally the load content, if you look in the upper right-hand corner where it says recording, the very top of your screen, that's where it will say load, upload. And so you don't see that because you don't have moderator privileges, but that's where you would load up your files. Yes, exactly. It's just in the upper right-hand corner. And so we're good with using PowerPoints, but say there's a Word document or PDF that you think would really be great to review during your session, and maybe you want to review the syllabus with your class, or you have a short reading for them, or something like that. Well, you can't view a document or PDF in the content area of Collab, but you do have a few options. And based on past experience, two of these are recommended over the others. So if you want to review a document or PDF during a live session, the best way to do it is to send it out in advance to your students through email or post it somewhere on your Collab site where they can find it and quickly download it during the session. Your other options are going to be to send it directly to them during the session through Collaborate's file transfer library, which works, but it can be a little buggy. And the other way to do it is through application sharing. You could open the document on your desktop and then share your desktop with the class. But as you'll see a little later, desktop sharing works but even on the best internet connections, and Pritpal mentioned this at the beginning of the section, there's a lot of delay, and it can be very buggy as well. Um, so sometimes it can even freeze up a session or crash it all together. So the less you have to desktop share, the better. And so your best bets are really going to be sharing um, your documents or PDFs directly through email or post it on your Collab site. And you know, I was going to show you the file transfer library, but, you know, I want to move on and I want to make sure we get to everything. If you'd like to learn how to do that later, you can always email me and um, we can talk about that. Okay, the next thing is the Page Explorer, and this is a navigation tool that automatically pops up whenever you load a PowerPoint to collaborate. And as you can see, the Page Explorer allows you to use arrows, a drop-down menu, and a scroll bar to explore thumbnails of all the slides in your presentation. So next to these navigation tools is the Follow button. It's up there in the right-hand corner. 
And when it's selected, which is the default status, all the student screens in the session will match the moderators, meaning as I click through the slides, which shows up on my screen will show up on yours. However, if the follow button is unchecked, then the collapsed version of the Page Explorer will appear in the upper right-hand corner of the student's content area, which will allow them to navigate through the slides on their own. So now, I just unchecked follow, and you should all see the navigation arrow arrows in the drop-down menu on your screens in your session. But also, directly to the right of the drop-down menu, you should see the dashed lines of the options menu. So go ahead and click on the options menu and select Show Page Explorer. And once you do that, you should see the same expanded version of the Page Explorer that I have on my slide. So go ahead and try that real quick. And this expanded version makes it even easier to scroll through and explore the slides. So you can go ahead and scroll through the slides, explore them. You can try double-clicking on any of them, and they should come right up on your screen. So go ahead and play around with that for a few more seconds. Let me know if it didn't come up for you. Okay, when I'm ready to resume, I just have to click on follow again, and you'll all be brought back to the slide that I'm on. Okay, so I just clicked follow, and we should all be back on the Page Explorer slide where we left off. And the last thing that I want to talk about here is Explorer mode, which the instructor can get to by clicking on the two gray arrows to the right of the follow button. I don't really find um, Explorer mode to be very useful, but what it does is it allows the instructor to lock the class on a certain slide while the instructor can look through the other slides without changing what's on the student's screen. So that's the Page Explorer. Let's go on to the Whiteboard's tools. So the Whiteboard is a really great tool for giving a presentation, but another good thing about the Whiteboard is all the opportunities that it provides for collaboration and interaction between everyone in the session. And one of the ways to do this is by using the Whiteboard tools, which are available to all session participants. So the Whiteboard tools are located on the left edge of the content area, right about in the middle of the screen. And you can grab them and move them around. So if you've done that, that's fine. Just try to remember where you put them, because we're going to use them in a minute. And as you can see here, I listed the functions for all of the tools. And when you click on each one, you'll see that several of them have alternate functions and shapes and colors. And to get you familiar with using the tools, we're going to do a couple quick activities. So in this slide, I have a county by county map of Virginia. And if you can all take a minute, choose a tool and a color, and just circle more or less where you're located today. I figured that since we're all spread out throughout the states, it'd be interesting to see where everyone is. And it's also just a good way to learn how to use the tools. So go ahead and circle or highlight your location. Um, and if you aren't in Virginia, maybe you could use the text tool to type in your location. I see somebody circled Charlottesville. I see, OK, there we go. Somebody out by the beach, I think I know who that is. I see some Northern Virginia. All right, cool. So this is just an example of a short little icebreaker type of activity that you could do at the beginning of one of your live sessions. I like to use the map activity a lot, especially with an online class since everybody's located all over the place. Let's do one more. So on this slide, let's all use the drawing tools to circle how we're feeling today. So go ahead. How are you? Good. Somebody's so happy. Somebody's tired. This one's sometimes really fun to use at the beginning of a class because you just never know how people are going to respond. And um, a lot of times it just lightens the mood. And, you know, these ice, icebreaker type of activities, they, you know, they might seem a little silly, but most of our students, they come to class after having worked a long day, and many of them have families, and they're very busy, and sometimes any little thing that you can do to, you know, kind of lighten the mood or make people laugh at the beginning of class can go a long way. All right, thanks. So even though these two activities fit more into the icebreaker category, I think I mentioned earlier, let me go back. I think I mentioned earlier when I do the content area that depending on what type of slides you use, these tools can be used with your students to highlight or make annotations on the slides, 
containing pictures or charts. You could use the tools to work through formulas or equations. And um, you could even clear out the slides and use the tools on a blank screen to illustrate a concept, work out a problem, or for brainstorming. So there's a lot of uses for the tools in a blank slide. All right, so that's about all there is with the whiteboard. Let's move on to application sharing. Um, so you'd use application sharing if you wanted to either share your desktop or a specific application on your computer with your class. So in order to do this, you should go into the menu at the top of the content area and click on the second icon. And what you see here on the slide is what would happen. And so you just click on Start Sharing underneath the Application Sharing icon. And what you get is a menu that looks like this. Um, it's going to ask you if you want to share your desktop, or you can choose another application that's currently open on your computer. And some reasons that you might want to do this with your class um, would be if you had a document on your computer that you wanted them to see, or maybe you had a software program on your computer that you wanted to show them how to use, but not everyone in the class had that same program on their computer, you could do it through here. Um, so I'm sure there's many other reasons why you might want to do this, but believe me when I said before that this feature can be buggy, and Paul testified to that earlier. Um, there tends to be a lot of delay in the picture that it, that it transmits to your students, and in general it just doesn't always work very well. And just to make the feature even more awkward, when you click Share Your Desktop, the entire content area of your Blackboard Collaborate session disappears. And this is something that's very awkward, especially the first time it happens to you. So it makes it seem like Collaborate just shut, shut down. Then the only way to bring back the content area is to click on an icon next to your name in the Participants panel. So in general, the tool works, but it's just not the most user-friendly in the world. And so with that in mind, I'm going to pass on sharing my desktop with you today, um, just in order to save us time, too. And we're going to move on to the web tour. And so the web tour actually works very well. And even though it's a somewhat basic tool, it can be very useful. So to go to the web tour, you'd click on the third icon up in the menu in the content area. And from there, as you can see from the slide, all that you need to do is enter a URL. And whatever website you type in will pop up in the content area. And there's just so many great websites out there that are specific to our own different content areas that you could just pull up during a live class session. So this one tool is one that I definitely recommend checking out. Just to show you how it works, I'm going to pull up UVA's website. And as you can see it there, it should have showed up for you. Um, put a red X if it didn't. And two other features about this tool that I really like, one is that the moderator can choose to have the website open directly and collaborate as I did here, or they can choose to have it open on their student's computer in a new browser. This feature is especially useful. Um, it's especially helpful if you wanted to have your students watch a video from a web website like YouTube, because you wouldn't want to stream the video directly from Collaborate, because it, it just wouldn't do it very well. But if the students are watching the video in a separate browser on their own computer at home, then you won't have any problems. And so the other nice thing that WebTor lets you do is publish the URL that you type directly to the chat window as a hyperlink, which I'll do here. And then that way, if something goes wrong with the web tour, the students can always just click on the link and go to the website. Any questions about the web tour? Yeah, I didn't get it. All I got was a screen saying waiting for web tour. Okay, it didn't show up for you. Did you get the did you see the hyperlink that um got published in the chat box? Yes. Okay. So that, that, like I said, that's one of the nice features is if it doesn't go through for one of your students, you can always just publish that link directly to the box and then they can click on it. All right. So um, we move on to the last parts of the content area that we wanted to talk about. And this is the breakout rooms. And so the breakout rooms can be created and used during a collaborate session to split your students up into different rooms and allow them to go off and work in groups. Um, this is a really good way to break up a session, especially if your class is scheduled to run longer than an hour, which I think most of our sessions do. So a good idea is to plan some type of group activity for your session, um, create breakout rooms, and then send your students off and let them meet for 10 or 15 minutes. 
This is really easy to do and it can be a good way for your students to interact with each other and engage with the course material, especially as they plan out a group project or work together to solve a problem. And the way that you do this um, is to go up to the tools menu at the top of the page, scroll down to breakout rooms, and then select create breakout rooms. When you do this, you'll see um, the menu that I have here on the right. And from this menu, you can choose how many rooms you want to create. And then you can also choose from sev several options for or how you want to split your students up. And so in addition to this menu, you can also drag and drop students into the rooms directly from the participant panel or by using the options menu in the participant panel. And so on this next slide, I just want to give you an idea of what the breakout rooms would look like um, from the moderator's perspective. As you can see, you can access the rooms from either the participants panel or the page explorer you can move yourself in and out of any of the rooms at any time to check in with your students or to provide them with feedback. And the last thing that I wanted to point out is that when the breakout rooms are created, they automatically start out with a blank page. And from there, the students can upload content, view the web, use the whiteboard tools, and generally do the same things that they could do in the main room. So I think we're going to move on to the last part of our session today. But before we do, does anyone have any questions about breakout rooms? I just wanted to add that I found those to be very, very helpful. I used them for the first time in the spring semester. And if you're doing a case study or just allowing students to have the opportunity to talk with amongst each other, it really it's a it really brings a whole level of intimacy to the class that you don't have um, otherwise and it makes it replicate kind of more of an in class setting. So I would encourage people to use that because students like talking to each other kind of and you can pop in and out of, of the rooms and listen as a moderator? Uh, whenever I have a uh, project, I assign project teams and always uh, try to make sure there's time enough for them to get together and break over at the end of uh, a regular session to work on their projects together. That's good, Paige. Yeah, it, it's definitely a very, very helpful tool. Um, Dan, do you have a question? You, you might have covered this, but I'm wondering two things. One is, um, if they work on something in those breakouts, how you bring that back to the whole group in the content box? And secondly, how do you bring everybody back together and close those rooms? OK, there are um, buttons for both of that. When you're the moderator privilege, when you have the moderator privileges enabled, you can um, I, I can't think of the you know exact correct menu right now off the top of my head, but there are buttons to bring the content from a breakout room back to the main room, and also to bring everybody back um, into the main room. And it's as easy as clicking a button or even dragging them back in. And you can also save content from the whiteboard or from any of the breakout rooms. So if your students come up with something brilliant that they want to keep, you can always save that. If, if um, specifically. No problem. And if, and, uh, if you're looking for specific instructions, I can. If you email me, I can provide you with those. And Bill, did you have a question too? Kevin, uh, unless I, it's because I don't have the moderator uh, privilege. I don't see breakout rooms under my tools pull down. Yeah, th that's exactly why you won't see them. Um, okay, I just if, want. I just want to verify. If I enabled them, they'd be right there. Okay, thanks. And Angela, go ahead. You know, I was just wondering, so what does it look like to the student when they're in the breakout room? Does it look like a whole separate blackboard where they can do their audio and use the whiteboard? Yeah, it, it looks exactly like what you're seeing right now. It's just you're going to be in a different room. They they don't really notice much of a difference. It's more that the instructor does because in my page explorer on the side, you can see on the slide, I'll see the four rooms I've created. And um, you can go in your participants list and you'll see the students' names. You'll know who is where. And you, you as the instructor can jump into their rooms and you know they'll have all the whiteboard tools and web tour and every, everything that they would have in the main room. And can they all hear you, though, as the instructor so you can make an announcement to everybody at one time, like, I'm bringing you back? I think you have to go in to the room for them to hear you, but I might be wrong about that. They might be able to hear you. I can't okay. recall the last time I used it. But you can go in. You can even set timers on them 
two where after 10 minutes they expire and everybody comes back kind of thing. Okay. And Pam, any, any other questions? Pam, did you have another question? Is your hand still up from before? Okay. Sorry, but I no do want, that does harken back to a question I did have, and that was um, how you eliminate all of the checks or the all the pollings that people provide for you when you ask a question and you get checks or you get A or B. When they come up on my screen, I'll see a feature that says clear, and I would just click that and it clears the poll results. Gotcha. Thanks. And. Guys, I know it's 1 o'clock and officially our session's up. Um, the last part of the session I was going to talk about some Blackboard Collaborate best practices. And I kind of designed the slides this way on purpose because if you do need to leave now, I can send you these slides and you can read through the best practices and you'll probably get, get as much out of them as me talking you through them. So if anybody does need to exit the session at 1, that's fine. If you want to you have time to stay in the session, I'm probably going to go through them. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that now. But um, I also will um, send these slides out to everyone who was in the room. I'll be able to go back and see who was here. And I have all your email addresses and be happy to send the slides. The other option, um, and thank you all for coming if you have to leave, as Kevin said. Um, another option we could do is to break this into two parts, Kevin and have like yeah, our next session in September and um, because I feel like there's so much information here that's important. I know Angela can stay. Can you all raise your hand? Who's able to stay? Because how much longer do you anticipate it going, Kevin? Uh, 10 to 15, I think. Okay. We can make it quicker if we need to. No, that's okay. I just want to make sure that we're not rushing too much, but that um, I wanted to um, also just before people leave, and I don't want to cut you off, Kevin, though, but um, if you all are able to um, email any suggestions for future sessions, because we really are trying to, try, trying to get as much information and have these kind of sessions for faculty um, to discuss topics. Uh, about you know online teaching. It's really focusing on the online teaching. So what are some things that you're having questions about or want to learn more about? Please email me um, and or Kevin, and and we can have you know a next section another session about this. But if people could stay, let's go ahead. I was going to say we could break it and do a two part session, but um, why don't you just finish up, Kevin? Then. Okay, for everybody who's here, thanks for staying. We're just going to power through these, and um, hopefully this will be the most helpful section for you all. So we're just going to talk about some general collaborate best practices, and um, then we're going to do some best practices for before, at the beginning, and during a session, and then we're going to cover some technical and instructional best practices. And I think somebody else may have their microphone still on. Maybe Angela? Okay, so we started the session off with um, a few general best practices for Collaborate, such as closing all other programs during a session, using a headset, being careful of the talk button, and so on. But here we have a few more general recommendations. And the first one, I really, I just can't stress this strongly enough. When it comes to your class, each one of you is going to need to be the Blackboard Collaborate expert. So when it's time to launch that first class and you have 10, 15, 20 students and things start to go wrong with the technology, as they inevitably will, you will need to be able to jump in, troubleshoot, diagnose, and help fix the problem or else risk the class being derailed. And I've seen it happen many, many times, so I speak from experience. And our students' time is at a premium and they don't want to sit around waiting for technical difficulties to be worked out. So please, if you've learned nothing else from the session, Take this advice seriously and take it upon yourself to really know the ins and outs of the tool. And at the same time, part of being an expert is knowing when to direct your students to collaborate support. Even I'm not capable of solving every issue like Pritbell had with the application sharing. So during a class, when times that are premium, premium, you have to know what you're able to solve then and there 
and then when you just need to send a student on to support. And always remember, if things go wrong, to reassure your students that the session is being recorded and that they can watch it later. So the way to become the expert is to practice, practice, practice. Run through your lesson a couple of times and collaborate uh, before your first class, because if you don't, you're just asking for something to go wrong. And once you get used to collaborate, you won't need to do this. But the first few times you use it, I can't emphasize enough how important this is. And live sessions that are plagued with te technical difficulties, they can really turn students off to collaborate. And we want this to be a tool that enhances their online experience and not one that detracts from it. So moving on, it's best practice to at least post a picture of yourself in the classes that you teach. Students like to see who their instructor is. And um, you can even encourage them to post a picture if they feel comfortable doing so. And it's just another way to enhance you know, the sense of a learning community. And it adds a more of a personal touch to the learning environment which can sometimes just seem kind of faceless. And then um, the last recommendation on the slide, if you're going to use the PowerPoint slides and collaborate, try and design them as, as clutter-free as possible, leaving only the most essential information on the slide. This isn't so much of a file size consideration, but more of an issue of how students' brains process and retain information when they're learning online. And there's actually a lot of research being done in this area, and it's pretty interesting stuff. If you Google search the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, you can find out a whole lot more about this. I think I skipped one. OK, we're back to where I was. OK, so before the session, um, it's the best practice to meet with your students individually for maybe 15 or 20 minutes in the week leading up to your first live class session and give them an overview of the tools and features. This is going to take you some time, but it's time well spent, and it's definitely going to pay off in the long run. Um, also, test your PowerPoint beforehand. When Collaborate uploads PowerPoints, it converts the slides into image files. And it doesn't happen often, but sometimes text and images may not come out formatted correctly as you had them before. So just remember from before, also don't preload your content. Just log on 10 or 15 minutes early to upload your slides. It usually it takes a few seconds to do. And also, if you plan on sharing any documents during the session, have them ready to go beforehand or have them emailed so you don't have to take time searching around for them. Um, so once you start the session, always remember to record. A lot of students like being able to go back and rewatch the sessions. And it's nice to have the recordings for the students who couldn't be there. But one caveat with recordings is that they will only capture the activity from the main room. So anything from the breakout rooms will be left out. Um, and also, if you're going to turn on super, supervising for private chats, just disclose this to your students. Um, even though it will say supervised in big letters over the chat panel, when you turn this feature on, um, you know, they're going to see it. But it's never a bad idea to remind them anyway. Um, and then always remember to take attendance. Collaborate gives you the option to save and print the participants list. But I think it's an even better idea to just print out your roster and put a check mark t next to everyone who showed up. Um, another nice thing about having your roster printed out is that you can just mark down points for participation next to student's name as the session goes along. Um, you know, so if they make a good point, just give them a little check mark. And last, um, try and get in the habit of always starting your sessions with an introduction or an icebreaker and just making the process a routine. Um, and in, in addition to the photo that I mentioned before, think about introducing yourself on the webcam each week. Since students really do like to see who their instructor is, but then remember to turn it off since you don't really want to be streaming um, live video any more than you need to. So yeah. Um, yeah, and then during the session, try and get in the habit of regularly glancing down at the participant, participant panel and the chat panel. Um, when you're lecturing or reading or leading a session, it can be easy to get wrapped up in what you're saying. But then if you forget to look down, you're going to miss raised hands and questions and text messages from the students. And I'm definitely guilty of doing this myself and missing all kinds of questions. So just try to get in the habit of looking down every now and then. Um, if a session is longer than an hour, which most of ours probably are, try and give your students breaks here and there. Um, also, one way to keep your session interactive and also to make sure that your students are engaged in the session is to ask for feedback. Do this early and often throughout your session. Um, you can do this by using polls or by asking students to respond to questions with raised hand or type text. 
And as we mentioned earlier, you can create a lot of opportunities for interaction by using the whiteboard, web tours, having students give their own presentations, and using the breakout rooms. And so just a few technical issues um, I wanted to remind everyone of. Um, if you're using Windows, Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome are OK. Mac, you can use Firefox and Safari, but um, don't use Chrome. Um, really, one of the main reasons when people say that their Blackboard Collaborate is not working, it has something to do with either their browser or their Java or their operating system not being updated. And these updates come out sometimes every other week or every month. So you really kind of have to stay on top of this and remind your students to do the same. Keep your software updated. Um, if you go to the Collab uh, support website, it'll ask ask you which version of Collaborate you're using, and UVA uses version 12.6, so you might want to jot that down. But um, any support material for version 12.5 works for us as well. And if you include a hyperlink in a PowerPoint that you want to show in your Collaborate session, it's not going to work. Because um, Collaborate, um, when they upload PowerPoints, they convert them to image files. So if you have a hyperlink, it's not going to work. You're going to have to type it in the text box or do a web tour. With audio, video, it's always, you know, seems to be a problem during sessions. Always use the audio setup wizard, even if you used Collaborate 100 times, because something may have changed on your computer that you weren't aware of. Just always get in the habit of doing that. Um, use a USB headset. It produces a better result than using your computer speakers. Um, my headset is a Logitech, and that's a pretty good brand. If you really hate headsets, um, and you want to use your computer speakers, try not to use your computer's microphone. And maybe try looking at a podcasting microphone. Um, Blue makes really good USB microphones. And I, I do use one at home. Um, and it seems to work out pretty well. And um, just remember to turn your mic off when you're not using it. It's one that shows up a lot. And bandwidth is always a consideration. Um, the session's only going to be as good as the person in your session with the slowest lowest internet speed. So you could be transmitting from your work or your home, and you could have this blazing fast internet speed at your house. But if your students don't, it's not going to matter. So you have to take steps to minimize the bandwidth that you're using in your session. So Blackboard allows six talkers or six cameras at a time, but really you're just better off with one or two. Um, try not to use a lot of high resolution images in your slides. Um, only use desktop sharing or application sharing when it's absolutely necessary. And try to avoid streaming video over Collaborate. You're going to want to do this through the web, or you can even upload videos into the Kaltura Media Gallery in your UVA Collab site. Can I just interject one point there? Yep. OK. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have used the, the video portion. I'm going to click on it right now. Um, OK, so here I am. Um, the students have I got my hair it's kind of messed up, but anyway, um, the students have said that they do enjoy seeing me sometimes, and, and they might want to do that. So you might want to consider, you know, doing the video when you're when you're doing um, your lectures or not. Um, I had a guest speaker come in, and, and that might be another topic for future um, sessions: is how to have a guest speaker. And when they have the speaker coming, you can actually turn on the webcam. So it's up to you if you want to use that, but. It does make the class a little bit more live as opposed to just having, you know, this, you know. So you do have to kind of prepare yourself. I, I'm just in my, you know, casual attire today. But it is something that can be another addition to making it more live and um, more intimate. And Celeste is absolutely right. The video is great. Um, I recommend using it. But like I said, you just really have to be prepared for you know, setting it up correctly and whether or not your students are going to be able to receive it correctly. And, you know, it just, it just um, you know, there's a whole other set of issues you have to be ready for. But it really is great when it works. And so, so just, again, you know, many of these things we've mentioned, but just some instructional best practices for Collaborate. If you're looking for some ideas, you know, obviously, um, you can hold your class sessions. You can host a guest speaker. You can record by yourself and collaborate, a lecture or a demo, and then just save it and post it to your collab site so your students can watch later. Students can do presentations. You can hold group meetings. 
you know, outside of class during the week, you can set up a room for your students to come in and meet in. And you can also have virtual office hours. You don't have to have a live class at all, but maybe once a week you do virtual office hours where your students meet you in collab and you can video chat back and forth. So there's really a lot of really good uses for this tool. And so we've reached the end. I have um, you know, a few other slides that really aren't all that important that we're going to skip over. And um, I just wanted to throw up these last helpful resources and links for all of you here. Um, if you'd like to see, I know Celeste has done a bunch of different um, collaborate sessions in the past. And if she has one that she thinks is really just a model of this is a great session. If you'd like to see it, if you want to email her or I, we can get you into that session to look at. Um, if you go to the top, your Blackboard Collaborate menu bar, there's a help button. And the second thing down should be Blackboard Collaborate Essentials for Moderators. This guide is really, really, really fantastic. And it's a great resource. And then if you click below that on additional help, it takes you to an on-demand learning center. It's also really, really excellent. So Blackboard Collaborate isn't owned by UVA. It you know, comes from an outside vendor. We just host the tool. So that's why all the support has to go through them. You know, we hate having to send you to them for support, but you know, it's their product and they're really, really good at it. So don't be afraid to visit their website. And um, you know, the link down there at the bottom is just a shorter version of the link to their website. Thank you so much, Kevin. I, it was really very, very interesting to hear the expert here talking. Um, and we're going to continue on with these sessions, so please keep us informed about other topics. As I mentioned, we're thinking of doing a, a session on how to use the iRubric, but we want to hear from you. What do you want to do? What do you want to talk about? These are for you as faculty. We want to help you enrich your teaching. So um, thank you again, Kevin. Um, and the next session is scheduled for the 19th of September. We're keeping it on the third Friday at noon um, of, each, of each month. So thank you so much. And um, again, just I want to appreciate you all taking the time to be with us. And um, we hope you continue to come to these future sessions. So thank you again, Kevin. Uh, I want to do a round of applause for Kevin there. There we go. Thanks, everyone. I hope it was helpful. Um, I can always, you know, answer questions or do one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, our email address is down there at the bottom of the screen. So, you know, anytime. We're always available. And thanks for coming and spending the extra time with us today.